evening, everyone. So my name is Gloria Arpezi, and I currently am the director of the Peter Gruber International Academy, which is the seventh through 12th grade program currently at the Virgin Islands Montessori School, soon to be the sixth through 12th grade program at the Virgin Islands Montessori School. And we have uh, two other administrators with us this evening, Mr. Bennett Ott, who will be leading you through this MYP journey this evening. And also Mr. Kevin McLean, who will be with us tonight. He's evening. currently our academic director. And Mr. Bennett Ott is currently our MYP coordinator. As a special guest this evening, we have Mr. Michael Fisher, who will be joining us as our PGI director next school year. So tonight's program is uh, an introduction to a very special academic program, which is called the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program. For short, very adoringly, we like to call it the MYP. And the MYP is a middle school adopted program, which takes into consideration uh, several different types of really interesting student-led student-centered learning um, uh, uh, methods and, and, and functions so that our students can be the very best that they can during a course which is known to all of us as one of the most tumultuous times in our life, which is middle school. And the MYP is a beautiful, beautiful program that allows students to be the best that they can be while allowing them to continue to keep that love for learning, which they certainly have when they are in kindergarten, when they are in elementary school, when they move into middle school, we want them to keep that love for learning. And the MYP allows students to do that. And so I assume that all the families that are with us tonight have a student that will be joining us next year in the MYP, whether it's sixth grade, seventh grade, or even older. Our uh, middle years program goes uh, next year will go from sixth grade all the way to 10th grade. And um, after that, we have a uh, an, an International Baccalaureate Diploma Program, which for anyone here who's interested, immediately following this program uh, from 6.30 to 7.30 tonight on this exact same Zoom link, we will be doing an orientation to the IB Diploma Program, which is 11th and 12th grade. So I know it's two hours, it's a lot of your time, but if anybody wants to stick around, even while you turn your camera off and you're cooking dinner, can listen to the diploma program orientation as well. It's immediately following this. Um, our school has adopted both of these programs for uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, and we've just been thrilled with them. Uh, before I turn the microphone over, I'll just let everybody know that not only am I an administrator and a teacher at our school, but I'm also a parent. And so um, I have most certainly seen my own personal children go through this program, and I couldn't tell you of a program that I believe in more than um, the International Baccalaureate Middle Years Program as it's time for your children to be able to thrive in middle school. So I'm going to stay and, and be able to be here for any sort of questions throughout, but I'd love to turn the floor over to the very capable and wonderful new leader that we have for the MYP, the wonderful Mr. Ott. Thank you, Ms. Arpezi, very, very much. And welcome, everybody. Good night, good evening. I guess we're still the good evening. Um, it's really wonderful to see everybody uh, and to share uh, my passion and all uh, sorts of information about the NYP at the Peter Gruber International Academy. Um, the way this will kind of work this evening, I've kind of broken this presentation up into three or four sections. At the end of those sections, I'll pause for a moment um, and open that up for discussion or for questions. If anybody has a question for myself, for Ms. Arpezi, uh, for Mr. McLean, uh, please feel free in those times or at the end of this, uh, this meeting to uh, uh, answer or ask any questions that you might have. We'll try our best to answer any questions you might have this evening. And if we can't, then we will certainly round back and make sure we answer that uh, to your satisfaction um, you know, tomorrow in the future. So just a couple of things real quick, introducing myself. Um, this will be at the end of the presentation as 
well. I encourage you to uh, uh, take my phone number, email address. I have an open door policy in terms of these. Uh, I want to be available in any way. Um, I am with an educator and this year an administrator at the Peter Gruber International Academy. So I'm an educator teaching middle school and high school Spanish and history. I have taught Spanish and I've taught history um, uh, both at the uh, Montessori School at the Peter Gruber International Academy and um, in Spain um, through all the way from grades, you know, kind of kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Um, and I do have on there my proud alma mater, the University of North Carolina, but I was born and raised a Kansas Jayhawk fan. So this year was a little confusing for me when we got to the national championship. But nonetheless, this year I am also an MYP coordinator, but next year I'll be transitioning into what we call the IV coordinator, which will be overseeing and coordinating both the MYP and the DP programs. Um, this is just a little preview, some of the contents of what we're going to be looking at this evening. We're going to just take a look at the general philosophy and idea of the IB to give you a general view of what this program is about, the philosophy that's behind it, um, why we are embracing and leaning into it so much. Then we'll talk a little bit about um, how we construct the programs and realize the programs at VIMSIA, at the PGIA. Um, and that is, you know, goes along with our learner profile in the VIMSIA way. Uh, we'll get into some MYP teaching and learning. We'll do a quick preview of some of the programs your students will be um, involved in throughout their experience in the MYP and their journey in the MYP. We're going to take us a real quick snapshot at assessments and what rubric and criterion-based grading looks like, and then just a few details and policies, and that should be a full, uh, full hour if I time it just right. So, um, there's going to be a test on this page at the very end. We have lots of acronyms that, fly, uh, that float around the PGIA and VIMSIA. Um, so please do take notes on this. Uh, this will be graded at the very end of the, uh, the uh, presentation. But no, International Baccalaureate, you'll often hear us talk about IB. You'll hear me refer to, and many of us refer to the MYP, our middle years program. And we are defaulting to the British spelling of program there. Um, the DP is the diploma program. That's going to be our grades 11 and 12. The MYP is our grades 6 through 10. The PGIA refers to the Peter Gruber International Academy. Most people will be pretty aware of our inter internal uh, acronyms. And then BIMSI, of course, is the Virgin Islands Montessori School and International Academy. So kind of introducing the IB and the MYP. Um, you know, the IB is the gold standard for curriculum um, and whole person development um, from grades three or from three years old all the way to 19 years old, right? And so the IB itself was founded in 1968, created the um, MYP program, and then just a couple years later, the, uh, the PYP program to offer a whole continuum, a curriculum and continuum program um, for students from ages three through 19. Um, it's a not-for-profit foundation, and it is really focused on bettering the world through developing agency, developing whole people, whole learners that are ready to take action and, and be a part of their local, their global, and their national communities. The mission of the IB is to create and develop inquiring and knowledgeable and caring people. You can see those bolded and highlighted words there. Uh, those are going to be recurring themes throughout your student's educational journey in the MYP and in the uh, DP program. They really reflect the core of what we're trying to develop in students and learners and in people and what we try to embrace ourselves as educators, as leaders, um, both in the world of the International Baccalaureate and at the PGIA. Right. And at the very, very heart of this is to develop this compassionate, active, lifelong learners who understand other people, who understand and embrace difference and want to act in the world around them on a variety of issues that are important to them, but are important locally and globally as well. And to see and develop the idea that we understand um, others by understanding different perspectives, we understand the world by understanding different perspectives. So let's dive into just a little bit of what guides the um, MYP. So the MYP and the DP are guided by the learner profile. And you can see on here, the learner profile is a, a suite of characteristics, of ideals, of visions we want ourselves to be as teachers and educators and leaders, but most importantly, what we want your students, what we want MYP learners and IB learners to aspire to be. It is literally the IB's mission in action and what it means to be a community of learners in action. 
So throughout your journey in the MYP and in the DP, your students, your children will be challenged to be knowledgeable, to take risks, to be principled and balanced, to be self-regulated and mindful, to really dive deep and be curious about the world around them, to embrace processes of reflection and metacognition that help them develop into independent uh, learners that own their own learning, right? And then the IB, it's a recognition that each person, each student own weaknesses with different skills, with a variety of values and a variety of experiences. And we want to develop in our students and in our children, a culture of tolerance, a mindset of understanding, of inclusion, students that are balanced in, in, in strategies of well-being and self-care, students that are curious and empathetic about the world around them, and students that are ready to challenge themselves to grow as academics, to grow intellectually, but also to grow as people and find their passions and their paths and their interests and hobbies in life. And as we say, again, these learner profiles, they help and strive to develop individuals that are active, they're compassionate. And I would add to that, that we strive to develop in our students the notion that we want them to be agents of change in the capacity that they wanna see change in their communities, in their world, and in their lives around them. We want them to be agents of happiness and positivity for themselves, for their uh, peers, and for the, everybody that they interact with in their community and their lives. This ties in very well with the Vimsia philosophy. We want to develop strong academics and we want to develop the intellectual promise in each of our students, but we also want to develop the whole person, a person that's engaged, that's passionate, that's not afraid to try new things, that's not afraid to branch out, a person that's grounded physically, socially, and emotionally, that has strategies and tools to deal with the complexity of themselves and the, and the world around them. And everything that we do in the IB and in the MYP really gears towards this mission, right? We wanna create educational opportunities for our students to promote these healthy relationships, that promote individual and shared responsibility, and that include these interpersonal competencies, right? These skills that help um, them to grow within themselves and to grow in collaboration with others. We want them to be able to come away from our education and our in their journey to make informed and reasoned decisions, ethical judgments, right? To be flexible and open in the mindsets and to inspire themselves and to others to do things differently, to see things differently and to engage in new, uh, in, in new opportunities. Right, we want to foster that development of that rich personal, academic, and cultural identity that lies at the heart of each and every one of us and at the heart of your students and children. So that's a little bit about the philosophy, right? We've got this six through 10 with the MIP, the grades 11 and 12. We're focused on academics. We're focused on the social emotional development and well-being. We're focused on the physical development and well-being and the development of that person as a passionate member of the world around them, the communities around them, ready to take action, ready to engage and confident in their ability to be agents in the lives of, of themselves, in their own lives and the lives of others. So I don't know if there's gonna be really any questions on that. If you do, I just wanted to pause for just a moment. If you have questions now, or if you have questions in the future, um, you uh, have my contact information, and please do reach out to me, reach out to Ms. Arpezi, reach out to Mr. McLean um, with any questions that you may have. Okay, well, I take that silence as a, as a good thing. I hope I've explained everything fairly well on that, that first part. So now let's dig into a little bit of what the NYP looks like in terms of its philosophy, right? So we're trying in this meeting to get a kind of a, a general view of the MYP and then how it manifests and is realized in the PGIA. All right, so what are we seeking to do with the MYP here, right? In the MYP at the PGIA, it's academically rigorous. We challenge our students in their course content and their development of conceptual understanding and their ability to transfer and apply what they're learning in the classrooms into service experiences and into other, other uh, experiences and activities that they might have be engaged in. It's a holistic education and development where we want to develop the academic and intellectual promise, but we also want to be sure we're developing the whole person, a grounded, socially, emotionally healthy, physically healthy, diverse and curious individual that's ready to go out into the world and take that change. We seek to develop globally minded people. That seems even more important every day that we go through this world, the importance of developing 
an identity of a global citizen, of a member of a global community, right? And the ability to, to have empathy with this interconnected and very complex world that students are gonna be entering into when they're adults. We seek to be multilingual and intercultural, helping students to develop their language abilities, second and third language abilities, but also their own cultural competencies and cultural understandings of themselves, and especially here in the Caribbean, but then also of others and all of the communities that surround them and the people that they will interact with and communities they will interact with in their journey as individuals. We seek to develop conceptual learners. We want to develop big thinkers, students and individuals that are able to take big ideas and concepts and apply them to different situations. I often tell my students that the concepts that drive the MYP and the drive IB education are the tools that allow us to understand the complex interconnected and interdependent world around us. They're the precision tools that help us to develop understanding. It's connected. Right, so we have a vertical alignment across our curriculum. What we're doing in the MYP is related to how our students are coming up from our Montessori program. What we're trying to develop in our MYP students now helps to prepare them for the DP and then beyond in university and in real life. So we take a whole, uh, a holistic view and a whole person and a whole development view across their educational journey. We seek to be inclusive in our classrooms, in our mindsets, our attitudes that we try to foster in ourselves and our students as leaders. We try to be inclusive in our curriculum, not shying away from topics that may frighten or be a little nerve wracking for maybe more traditional models of education because that is the world around us. The world is complex. It's fraught with all sorts of issues, all sorts of problems, all sorts of complexities. And we seek to embrace that and not to run away from it. It's broad and it's balanced. We develop broad-based learners that are skilled in multiple disciplines and at different levels within side of those disciplines. And we meet the students where they are at in their educational journey. And most importantly, and I think um, everybody at the school firmly believes this, we are preparing students for the world that they will enter, not the world that we have come from, not the world that we would imagine it to be or hope we hope it to be, of course, but we're also preparing students for the world that we think that they're gonna enter in the year 2030, 2035 and beyond. So that's kind of a little bit of an overview. What drives learning and teaching in the MYP? So your students are gonna be in, your class, in our classes, all right, so how does a teacher approach building a unit, giving a lesson, right? What is the philosophy that first guides our teachers? Well, here it is. This is our inquiry, our action, and our reflection. And this reflects the idea that at any point in time, when you go into a course of study in a unit or into a classroom, you're going to be seeing thinkers, you're going to be seeing students that are engaged in asking questions, thinking about how they're taking action and reflecting, and I'm sorry, and demonstrating their knowledge and understanding of content, of concepts and context. You're also going to have learners that are thinking and reflecting and taking part in metacognitive processes that help them to develop into independent learners that are owning their own learning process and taking more and more responsibility for their own learning and their own person as an individual, right? And we seek to challenge students through this model to become successful, independent thinkers and learners, right? And any point in time in the process of an MYP course, students will be engaged in inquiry, right? Asking, asking the questions, right? Taking action, thinking about things and reflecting. So that's kind of the heart of what drives what teachers are thinking about how they're going to engage with our students and with your students. I love this quote, and I just leave it here for just a moment. This comes from the first director of the MYP, I'm sorry, the IB. And it really reflects well what we're trying to do in the MYP, what we're trying to lean into. We have in mind with the MYP that we're preparing students for a different program in the diploma program after grade 10. But in order to prepare students to be successful in a very rigorous, very academic heavy program, which is the diploma program, we need to develop big thinkers. It's not important as a history teacher, I often tell my students, it's not important for you to regurgitate every date and every name that was associated with a certain event. What I want you to understand is the big ideas. What I want them to understand is how things are interconnected. What I would like them to do is to see a concept like change or to see a concept like identity in a science class or in a history class, and then to see that concept at work in a math class or in an art class, to develop big ideas and big lateral flexible thinking that prepares them 
for the rigors of the diploma program. And this quote captures that perfectly. This is not about memorization and rote memorization of facts and data. This is about challenging students to be big thinkers, to be risk takers, to understand how their learning relates to themselves and the world around them and how they can translate that learning and that understanding they're developing into all sorts of different actions, whether that be on projects, or whether that be in community and service action programs. So what kind of guides MYP, um, the, the, I'm sorry, back up there, what guides an MYP curriculum? It's concepts, it's context, and it's skills. Our concepts are the big ideas that can be transferred into different situations that the students will see in each of their units of study from grade six all the way through grade 10. They'll understand how change or how communication works in a theater course, but then they'll also understand that concept as it plays out in a language acquisition course, right? And so we have this idea, right? These are what ground the concepts that students are working this is how we make concepts applicable and real to the learners in front of us. Context helps students understand how they relate to what they're learning, how they relate to the concepts and the content of a course, but it also helps them to relate to broader things that are happening in their communities and in the world around them. And we often call these global contexts are also related to issues of local and global significance that we want our students thinking about and engaged in because ultimately, we're preparing them for their future and the world that they're going to enter. All the great things about that and then all the challenges that they're going to encounter as well. And so we want them to be broad thinkers in terms of context and in terms of concepts. The next thing that we try to develop in our students are approaches to learning. These are skills, these are academic and just life-based skills. I often tell the students that these are skills that I try to work on and reflect on myself as a teacher and as a human being and as an adult. And we try to model that for our students. So our ATL skills in the MYP are broken down into five broad categories that have all sorts of subject specific and then kind of subtopics that are related to each of those. Communication skills, right, relate to how we're interacting with ourselves, how we're interacting with others, how we're understanding audiences and communicating information uh, to different contexts and to different audiences. We talk about developing social skills. These are our collaborative skills, our ability to work together, our ability to negotiate and to manage conflict and resolution to reach consensus. We talk about self-management skills a lot. These can fall into the category of how am I organizing my planner? Like, man, I'm in grade seven and I cannot keep up with all of this stuff. I'm not just looking at manage back or I'm looking at my Gmail. Okay, well, let's work on an ATL skill like using a planner or developing a Google Calendar kind of program so that you can manage some of your things better. Managing your states of mind. Right? How well am I practicing mindfulness? How well am I regulating through my emotions and stress? How well am I handling conflict? And then the metacognition, right? These are reflective self-management skills. How am I developing as a person that's taking ownership of my learning? It's becoming an independent learner. We challenge students on their thinking skills, creative thinking skills, your critical thinking skills, your reasoning and analytical skills, your ability to make arguments and see perspectives, to take ideas from one situation or concepts from one situation and transfer them to another and create understanding on your own through that process. And then finally, and of course, being a historian, we really push for research skills as well. How am I interacting with mediums and information that's coming at me? Right? How am I understanding the different types of information? How am I creating information? How can I be a responsible content creator of information? How can I be a responsible digital citizen? So all of these categories are explicitly taught in any given unit of study and any lesson that you might walk into, into an NYP classroom. You might see one day uh, for myself, I know my students will, will complain quite a bit that I do lots of extemporaneous public speaking activities, right? You, know, so you might step into my class and we're learning how to build an effective presentation. They have to come dressed up. They have to come prepared for the presentation. You might walk into a dance class and they're talking about the practices of yoga and meditation and visualization in order to perform a routine, right? And then we also assess these skills. Um, each semester, the entire MYP team will get together and assess where the student is at 
on the scale of development of each of these ATL skills. And those run from, hey, I need to copy and model this and I need to be taught quite a bit all the way to, I am an expert and I can show others how to do this and help others how to do this. And that's a very important part of our overall assessment of our students. We assess their academic performance to be sure, but because this is a skills-based program as well, we um, assess their, uh, their, the progression of their skills. So, excuse me one second, okay. So once again, what drives an NYP education? It's conceptual learning and understanding, developing big thinkers. It's based in, on, in, in, I'm sorry, on inquiry into issues of local and global significance. It's interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and international in its scope. We seek and challenge students to build interdisciplinary projects to make connections across grade levels to be student leaders. It's differentiated to meet the needs of all of our learners. We see the student and meet the student where they are at in a given day, a given week, a quarter, a semester, or throughout the year. It's focused on teamwork and collaboration and the development of the ATL skills. It develops independent and skilled learners who are ready to take action, who have a sense of agency and growing agency and confidence in their capacity to be agents of change. And that doesn't mean to be an activist or an agent of change on a, necessarily on a political issue, but to be agents of positive change in their communities and in the areas of their life that are passionate or that they're passionate about and that they're dedicated to. And it seeks to develop the whole person, academically and intellectually, socially and emotionally, physically and communally. We try to never sacrifice one for the other as we firmly believe in our vision that we can develop all of these aspects of the student and the NYP and the IB and the way we implement and manifest the NYP and the IB philosophy really pushes and challenges students in all of those areas. So that's kind of a philosophical approach to what the NYP looks like um, in the PGIA what guides what we're doing, what I'm doing as an NYP coordinator, but also as an educator, what guides our department heads and our various departments, the philosophies that are overarching across, the, uh, uh, across our programs. So any questions on that? Feel free to, to, to ask. Unmute yourself or... Yes, Kate. Um, you mentioned uh, at one point community service. Um, so I was just curious to know if there are like any annual events or activities that you do for that. Yes, there are quite a few. And um, the next section, we're going to dive into that. But just to uh, briefly to answer your question, <clears throat> excuse me, to briefly answer your question, we have a rigorous uh, uh, service as action program for the NYP, right? And that requires consistent engagement with your service, uh, with the service advisor, right? And your service coordinator, right? And that's both throughout the year. There's requirements for that throughout the year. Then there are also projects um, that can gear towards service. Our community project is a project that gears itself towards service. The personal project can as well. And then on top of that, we also encourage and I incentivize, you know, in, in my best way so I can, we encourage our, uh, our teachers to craft assessments that allow you to demonstrate service through an assessment, right? So that's where, where we want you to take what you've learned in a classroom and actually apply it in different ways. So there's multiple avenues that you'll engage with service in your experience in the NYP and the TPP. Okay, so I'll move on. On. So let's look at the programs in the PGIA. All right, so we have our core academic courses. We have our English, our language and literature course. We have our language acquisition, Spanish, our individuals and societies, and I'm going to go a little bit into depth on each of these in just a moment, math and sciences, arts, design, and PE. So our English is our language and literature sequence that goes from grade six to grade 10. You'll be exploring poetry, works of literature, short stories, theatrical performances, a variety of different, um, different interactions with the world of language and literature through our fantastic um, English teachers at the school. Spanish, as some of you may know, is divided into phases. These phases are based on your ability 
um, as a as a language speaker, right? We have a phase one, which is kind of your just your intro to Spanish, all the way up to a phase five and six, which really dives into almost Spanish literature course. Our Spanish literature course is it would kind of be like a, a phase six. And typically, if you're coming in at sixth grade or seventh grade, you're going to come in in phase one. And then you'll progress through those phases, maybe phase two if you have a lot, of, if, you, if, you, if you progressed a lot in the Montessori program, but then you'll progress each year from phase two to phase three. Phases one and two are what we call emergent speakers, right? And so you're just getting introduced and getting your uh, feet on the ground in terms of the language. Our phases three and four are what we call a capable level. You've mastered some of the basic building blocks of the language, and now you're ready to take this a little bit further and to start to express and hear expressions of the language and, and interact with the language at a deeper level. And then finally, um, the proficient level is our phases five and six. And not everybody will get to the proficient level. Some of you may, Kate, and I think that you may uh, be in the, uh, in the proficient level there, um, where you're going to be challenged to really explore and expand your understanding interaction with the language at a very profound and deep level guided by native speaking teachers. Our math uh, program is guided both by the IB and by uh, common core curriculum and standards. And so we go from, you know, all the way from pre-algebra to algebra one, algebra two, geometry, a bit of pre-calculus and statistics also peppered in there at the end of it. Our science progression will work from your basic earth sciences to your basic physical sciences, then into physics, biology, and chemistry, all with the idea that one, we're developing these big thinkers, these conceptual and contextual thinkers and these skilled scientific thinkers as well. But also all of these courses are aligned to preparing our students for um, what will come in the DP, the skills that they'll need to be successful DP students, the deep conceptual understanding they'll need to navigate these rigorous academic courses in the DP. All right, the contextual understanding to contextualize all of the information that's coming at them in the DP. I skipped my course, the individuals and societies there, right? So our individuals and societies is a social sciences and humanities course, right? Our curriculum tends to bend pretty heavily in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade towards conceptual units that are built around themes, themes like the industrial revolution, themes like globalization and trade, themes like civilizations. Once we move into the eighth, ninth, and 10th grade, our curriculum becomes a little bit more dominated by history. Right, so these will be our world history, American history, Carib uh, Caribbean history, and then all throughout the sequences of history. And this is very much a, a you know a, a, an important value for uh, for our school to embrace and our history program and our other programs to embrace. There will always be Virgin Islands history and culture components built into that INS curriculum. So that could be, for example, my eighth graders are working with a colonial Virgin Islands history. So we're looking at issues all the way up to emancipation in 1848. Seventh grade units look at the story of carnival from its inception in, in the Roman Empire all the way to the Virgin Islands and what it means. 10th grade students work on units that deal with industrialization and the growing industrial world. And they look at how, how the Virgin Islands grew and evolved and developed um, you know, in the late 1800s, the late 19th century up into its modern history today. Our arts department is guided by four disciplines. We have theater, music, visual arts, and dance. And these are the four pillars and cornerstones of our arts uh, progression. In the sixth and the seventh grade, students will engage in semester units of study. So in sixth grade, you'll be in an intro to music course. You'll be in an intro to visual arts course. In seventh grade, you'll be in an introductory to theater course, followed by an intro to dance course. Once you get to eighth and ninth grade, you'll be able to choose based on a semester offering, which art course you would like. So say maybe you've really enjoyed visual arts progression with Ms. Cornette in grade six. So you wanna try semester one visual arts and you really love Ms. Helen's dance class and you get to try dance um, you know, for semester two, but we try to build in that too. It's kind of like a DP light arts courses where you're really starting to dive deeply into the advanced nature and structure of a visual arts course or of a uh, dance course or of a theater or music course. 
We are very excited um, to also be building our music program under the expertise of Miss Joey Bird. This is a new development and a new goal at our school. Um, and we hope that in the coming years that that will grow from a seventh and eighth grade and or, I'm sorry, an MYP program into a full blown Vimsia music program that goes all the way from La Casa or pre-K all the way up to grade 12 and DP music. But that is going to be a work in progress. And that is part of our growth and our vision for the future moving forward. And of course, we have our physical education that does not just deal with getting out and running on the playground, but understanding practices of well-being, um, understanding how to work effectively with teams and collaborate with others, understanding how our bodies are developed and how to take care of them, right? And so we try in this academic core here to really develop, once again, that whole person, a, a rigorous academic program, a program that's focused on social and emotional well-being, on physical development, and on being a balanced, internationally minded, globally minded person that's embraced these learner profiles. We have some core programs. I kind of refer to them as our core programs that uh, move away from academics. So we have our MYP core courses for grades six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. These are courses where we work on ATL skills development explicitly, right? So we'll have, uh, you know, activities and lessons on a variety of these ATL skills. We also build in choice reading time to encourage and cultivate and foster just that deep love and joy of reading. And then this is also where we work on some digital citizenship skills. So this is a core development course. We have a services action program, right? And I'll kind of elaborate on that in just a bit. We have our grade eight community project and our grade 10 personal project. And then we also have in the coming year, student life courses of which students will be engaged in three of those each semester that are designed for them to pursue their passions, or if they're not totally sure what their passions are, to pursue, to, to learn from others and learn from teachers who have extreme passions. So let's take a look at some of the core programs real quick. We have our services action program. I often tell families and, um, you know, I was, uh, uh, part of my education comes from the Jesuits. And so service and learning is very, very much at the heart of what I believe a really beautiful thing. Our services action program is not a program that's based about building community service hours. It's about students engaging and debaters. That looks like we're doing like three experiences in the entire year. But as you progress on from eighth grade to ninth grade to 10th grade, those experiences grow. You need to have five and six, and then finally 10th grade, seven experiences. And what this does is it helps students to connect their learning to the real world. Right? We want to activate the learning that students have engaged in in the classroom, the things that they have learned previously. And we want them to apply that learning to understanding the needs of communities and others around them and building really authentic experiences that help and address those needs, whether that be a local need of helping the Humane Society or doing a beach cleanup, or whether that be writing a letter to the president or to a member of Congress or proposing a change in our, our, our software platforms, which one of our students did this year to a company that manages our software platforms. We want students to be able to think about the communities around them as communities that need people to be active participants, that need them to be agents involved in their community. This is what our service program really seeks to develop. It helps to build these skills, these ATL skills, because now you have to apply these skills to manage these projects, to manage independent service actions. It builds the whole learner. So it helps to connect the learner with what they've learned intellectually, content and concept wise in their course, the skills that they've worked on to now seeing how that applies in the real world around them in a variety of ways. And it builds relationships and builds community, right? It builds connections with mentors, with experts, with organizations that are doing good work it helps students to interact and understand this complex world and build relationships and build community that help them to better understand and engage with the world. We have our MYP projects, right? So these are a community project for grade eight. These are our personal projects for grade 10. These have deep connections to the DP. <coughs> Excuse me, our community project aligns completely with our CAST project that 11th and 12th grade students will have to undertake. This is a, a creativity, action, and service project. 
and activities that they have to engage in over the course of their 11th and 12th grade year. The grade eight community project prepares students to do that. It's a semester long project. A few examples this year of what students came up with. A couple of my students, grade eight students came up with developing a dry garden um, and, a, and, and a, a learning garden in one of our, our outdoor spaces. Another student developed an anti-phishing application through his Cyber Patriots course that he then hoped to use and, and roll out for free to senior citizens in our community to help them you know, understand and, and beware of phishing attacks. Another student, like I said, built a proposal to manage back to make it more student friendly and plan that all out. Wonderful, amazing things come from these community projects and these ideas that students have. Several a couple of students wanted to do murals for the Trevor project, but it engages the student in this interdisciplinary broad thinking, challenges them to think about what they've learned, what they're passionate about and how they can take action on that, but also how they can learn a bit more about communities in need and organizations or people in need. Our grade 10 personal project aligns very well with the DP extended essay. This is a project that's of deep personal interest that students have to pursue over the entire course of their grade 10 experience and journey. Both of these projects are managed largely outside of class. So once again, this skills-based learning, we're teaching students how to manage big, big projects, how to manage big responsibilities in preparation for even bigger responsibilities and bigger projects and deeper learning that will happen in the DP. Some examples of the personal project, I had a student that developed a COVID safety and travel website. That was my advice. Another student organized and engaged in a basketball camp as well as we could with COVID teaching and, and, and organizing students around the principles of basketball. Um, another student developed a really beautiful uh, 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 dress, um, you know, from planning all the way to creating this dress that helped you know, make her feel comfortable with her body image and, per and perceptions. Another student um, had developed a candle making business, right? They weren't terribly interested maybe in all the academics, but said, I'm really interested in business and I really love doing these candles and lotions. So I'm gonna start a business of doing that. So once again, activating that personal agency, that personal curiosity, that deep desire to be agents of change, to act, to be active members and compassionate members of the community, right? And these projects connect them to their prior learning, they connect to their skills, they activate that conceptual learning and understanding that students are engaged in consistently in their courses. So that's kind of some of our, our uh, just a snapshot of the programs that make up the core of the NYP and the PGIA, our academic programs and our core programs. And I just offer, is there any questions that anybody has about any of that information? So now we're just gonna go, um, I've got just a few minutes left here and I wanna make just a little bit of time um, for uh, any kind of questions at the end. And we're gonna look at just a little bit of assessment. I don't intend to, to go too deeply into assessment, but assessment is different in the NYP. And I think it's very important that we understand um, just a little bit about what assessment means. All right, so our assessments are built around formative and summative or summative assessments. You know, a formative, Mr. Arpeggio often likes to say a formative assessment is like all the things you got to do to practice for the game, right? You got to get out there. If I'm a huge basketball fan, you got to get out there and shoot 100 free throws, right? You got to get out there and shoot the baseline shot. You got to get out there and try your layups. You got to practice all these little things. You also got to spend a little time and study how an offensive play works or how a defensive set works. So formatives are really all of those little things, those little components um, that help students to understand the concepts they're working with that helps students to start to understand the context they're learning in, that helps students to understand the skills that are really important to be able to, uh, to, to demonstrate, that are necessary for them to demonstrate their knowledge and understanding of content, of concepts, and of context. You know, oftentimes our teachers kind of scaffold out or reverse engineer from the very end of a unit. This is the big summative assessment that I want my students to engage in. These are the concepts that they need to be able to work with. These are the contexts, or this is the context I want them to work with, and these are the skills they need in order to be able to explain and demonstrate their understanding, and they'll develop formative assessments or maybe homework assignments or in-class assignments that practice little bits and pieces of those components of the overall summative assessment. Now, the summative assessment is where you demonstrate your knowledge and understanding. We progress through our skill development, our conceptual development and understanding and learning our contextual understanding. And now it's your turn as a student 
with the guardrails off, without a lot of support from the teacher to show that you understand that you've taken something from that unit. That can look traditional for some courses. You know, you might find in a math course or a geometry course, you might have a few um, assessments that are kind of like exams, a summative assessment that looks like an exam. But you also have lots of other ones, projects, case studies, essays. I do lots of research essays and case studies. You might be asked to do a reflection process as part of a summative assessment to reflect on the skills that you develop or the conceptual understanding that you develop. But our summative is what forms the basis of the majority of your grade. It informs what teachers are building in terms of your end of a uh, project or unit grade, your quarter and semester grades, and then your overall grade. Our assessment is penalty free in the MYP. We don't penalize for students turning in things like that doesn't mean that we have a big advertisement and say, hey, just turn anything in, whatever you want, right? But what we understand um, late work or other issues that might come up in terms of getting work or summative work or essays or exams in, it's really just about, well, we might need to talk about some skills that we need to work on, whether it's like self, you know, self-management and planning skills or, you know, kind of keeping up with the, or in general, just how we're keeping up with the flow of our work. So we don't penalize for that within a reasonable time frame. Now, granted, if you turn something in 30 or 40 days late, it's going to have to have a pretty good excuse and note from home. And, um, but, um, but we still will score that based on what we see the students' performance as. Typically, our zone of kind of turning that work in is at about 10 days. Right. This is about the evaluation of the progression and development of the learner and the student over the course of an entire year. We do not ever sit down and take all of those scores that we see over a quarter or a semester or a year and average them all out and say, OK, right, you bombed this first assessment at the very beginning of the year. You did terrible. You had a bad day. You were sick. There was stuff going on at home. You were traveling, whatever it might be. You just didn't have a good day. That's OK. That's called being a human being. We all sometimes struggle and all have bad days and we don't penalize students for those moments because we have them. Every human being has those moments. So what we do is we try at the end of a quarter, at the end of a semester, at the end of a year is to grade on the progression of that student throughout the year. And we try to factor in, yes, there's ups and downs. That's just a very much part of life. But where did they start at? in terms of their skills, their ability to work with concepts and context, their ability to understand the content of my course, right? And where do they end up at? And oftentimes we see that trajectory is a nice progression with a couple of little peaks here and there, but it always tends to progress um, towards, uh, towards the positive, right? And our assessment is also, it's rooted in that conceptual understanding, right? The development of skills and that contextual understanding on top of the content of the course for sure. So let's dive in just a little bit, right? So oftentimes, you know, when P uh, families are just coming into the PGIA or just coming into the IB or to the MYP, we're really familiar with these traditional modes of assessment, you know, zero to 100%, you know, and the breakdowns of that are A, B, C, D, E, F, and, you know, or not E, F, but F, right? And then the, the gradations in between that. We do not use a system like that. Every course is guided by four assessment criteria, right? And these have to do, you can see here's the science um, criteria, right? It's a criterion A is a knowledge and understanding, a criterion B is an inquiry, the criterion C is pro, uh, processing and evaluating things, and the criterion D is reflecting, right? So each course is guided by four core criteria, and each of those criteria are assessed out of a scale of one to eight, right? And one being I didn't really, wasn't able to demonstrate a lot of knowledge and understanding, and that seven, then eight, like, I have blown away the grade level expectations for this course, for the skills, um, for the demonstration of skills and conceptual understanding. But in general, criterion A for all of your courses will kind of assess, what do you know? What's the content, the terminology of the course? Criterion B will challenge students to investigate, to dive in, to inquire to, uh, in that specific subject discipline. Criterion C will talk about how you're communicating, how you're evaluating how you're citing things, how you're working with sources. And criteria D often gets into that critical thinking, that analytical um, uh, uh, side of, uh, uh, of, the, of the course development, right? How well are you understanding issues, models, theories, um, concepts? How well are you able to make arguments and see perspectives? So in general, each course is guided by four criteria, right? That are based on the concepts, 
that are based on the skills, that are based on the content. And each of those criteria are assessed on a one through eight basis. And at the end of each semester, you'll have you know, roughly two, of, uh, or you'll have each of those criteria assessed twice in a summative way. And that's how, that's what's gonna inform the majority of that grade, right? right? Now, each criterion itself is broken down into specific strands, right? That detail what students need to be doing. In the science discipline here with knowledge and understanding, you can see that we have this criterion A is broken down into describing scientific knowledge is one way we can assess. We can look at how they're applying scientific knowledge and understanding is another way we can assess. We can look at how they're analyzing information to make scientifically supported conclusions and statements. We can assess all of those in a given summative, or we can just say, hey, for this summative, I really just wanna focus on you know, describing the scientific knowledge. And, and then how do we end up assessing our students, right? Um, throughout the course of the semester, your uh, teachers will look at both the formative and summative work. The majority of the grade will be assessed based on that summative performance. The formatives do inform the grade. And the idea too is that if you're not keeping up and doing well on formatives, you're probably not gonna do as well as you could on a summative, right? And so they make the best judgment based on where the student has progressed, um, both in formative and summative work. They'll work with their department um, in making this decision and they'll find what the best fit is for the progression of the student over the course of that quarter, semester, or year. And then that assessment, right? We're not gonna get too far into this, is then broken down into semester grades, right? And our semester grades now are not based on the one through eight scale, we take the points that they add up in each of their disciplines and it gets translated into a formula and you'll get a one through seven scale of a final score for a semester at the end of a term, right? One obviously being, you know, a very low performance and seven being that superlative kind of A plus performance. Now I had mentioned, I just wanted to give an overview of assessment of a highlight of things in the MYP because at the start of next year, we're gonna have a, many more sessions. We're gonna have new family academies throughout the entire first semester for sixth, seventh grade families, and as well as any other new MYP family that are gonna address these specifics of what is a criterion-based curriculum? What does this eight mean? What does this five mean? What does knowing and understanding an INS mean? We'll really try to dive deep in and support you in understanding completely and really at a deep level, the way we assess the nature of our programs and more. So I wanted to kind of just offer this as a quick snapshot of what assessment of what our approach and philosophy to assessment looks like, as well as the other general um, kind of overviews. Is there any questions about assessment? Okay, so now it's coming the time for the assessment for you all for all of the acronyms, okay? So this is gonna be on a one through eight scale. So we should all see eights on all of this. Now, the last thing that I just wanted to talk about here is the details in our policies, right? We are a community that is connected to you. We can't do what we're doing. We cannot achieve the success that we want to achieve, that we want to achieve in our programs, in our classes, um, in, in with your students, without you, the parents, without you, the families, without the partnership of administration and school leaders, and without the partnership of students and teachers in your classroom. And that forms the foundation of what we're trying to do. Our connection, our community with you is open. This is a two-way street between myself, between Mr. McLean, between Mr. Fisher, the incoming director, or, you know, Ms. Arpezi this year as well, if there's any questions in all of your teachers. It's an expectation that we have of ourselves. It's something that we really encourage our, um, our families to also be in constant communication. And that doesn't always just mean that, hey, you know, Johnny's not really doing too well. He was disruptive in class. We send out like put-ups all the time, affirmations. Hey, you know, Emily did a great job in class this week, was really knocking out of the park, really brought like an idea that I hadn't thought about. We really try to not just have that relationship be one of like, a, you know, when things are not going well. We also want to make sure that we're always in touch when things are going well, because there's so many amazing things your kiddos are doing in our school and in our programs, all right? So we have all sorts of student supported programs. We have our learning support specialists, our emotional support specialists. Um, we have our student life programs that will help to develop that holistic student. There will be more on that at later meetings. 
right? We use manage back as this tool to manage the lessons, to manage the interface between the teacher and the student and the teacher and the family. There will be much, much more to come on manage back as the next year unfolds. That will be certainly a topic for one of our academies, right? We believe too in cultivating in our students this idea of self-advocacy advocacy of being responsible, independent learners. Our students will probably say they could get really, really rich if they could, you know, if they got a penny every time they heard the word self-advocate. We want our students to speak up, to use their voice, to be those agents, to realize their agency, to advocate for themselves, to advocate for the things they're passionate about, right? And we really encourage that. We help to cultivate that and we hold space for that. And obviously they're gonna need to be good time managers as well. They got a lot coming at them. They got a lot of things they're doing, but they have lots of support around them to be able to manage all of the rigors and all the different aspects of this amazing MYP program, right? We have our passing policies and our report card expectations, right? We have our honors programs. If your student makes a certain uh, uh, level in their performance in their, uh, in their courses, they can, are eligible for, for an honors program. We'll have a national honor society starting up as well which will kind of help to reinforce that, right? And if students do fall behind, or we see you know, that, there's, you know, that there's, there, there's issues and there's trouble happening, well, we're gonna be in close contact with you. We're gonna develop success plans um, for that student um, to support them and to support you as families uh, to, uh, so the student can achieve the, you know, the, the, the most success that they can envision for themselves. And then finally, we do have an honor code, right? Students will be well aware of that as we unpack that at the start of the new year, right? We have a student created dress code, right? So we try to be, we're the only school in the Virgin Islands that does not have a uniform policy. We do have a dress code though, um, and it is completely created by students with a little bit of guidance for teachers. You know, we embrace technology, but we also have, you know, certain cell phone restrictions and cell phone policies. And we also have tardy and absence policies, obviously, to be a good learner, to be successful, to be effective, you need to be, you know, where you need to be on time for most of the time. And I wanted to just put this up here one more time, my contact information, but I, I thank everybody so very much for joining us this evening. I am really, really excited and very passionate about the Middle Years program, about the IB in general. I'm really excited to bring your students into this journey as well and to be there as a guide for them. I am their biggest advocate, their biggest coach. I will always be there pushing them, but also being there to support them in any way that I can. It is deeply my passion. It's something I'm called to do. So please feel free at any point in time. If you have any questions, let me know. 